finally finished up John chapter 10. I want to go to John chapter 11 tonight. Get everything opened up. Get older, your old hands don't work good anymore. Get older, nothing works good anymore. Anybody else got issues with that? Yeah. Oh, you just wait, you young people. Yeah, you're going to have fun. One of my favorite tracks says, Love You, and it's signed Mac. Amen. Back in Brazil, with Linda, uh, Sister Linda Carter's daddy gave that to me years ago. Amen. And thank the Lord for that. All right, John chapter 11. Uh, very important uh, story that we're going to start reading tonight, John 11. If you're familiar with the Word of God, you understand uh, it's going to be the raising of Lazarus is found in this particular uh, chapter. Matter of fact, uh, John is the only chapter that references this miracle that Christ did. Very interesting. Most, most time you have what's called the harmony of the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll find the same story in either all four, two of them, three of them, or whatever uh, story that's only found in one of them. Very important one. Uh, it deals with both the humanity and the deity of Jesus Christ in this particular chapter. Uh, we think about the God-man. He was 100% man on his mother's side. Christ was 100% God on his father's side. So you find in John, John is the eagle, and it deals with the deity of Jesus Christ and who he was. In John chapter number 11, you're going to find that both attributes of Jesus Christ are found in this chapter. Uh, I want to read that first two or three verses very quickly. Now, a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha, verse number two, and it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was sick. We find a family in Bethany. Bethany was just a small town right outside of Jerusalem, right on the other side of Mount Olivet. Uh, when Christ came to, to uh, uh, Jerusalem, he, as far as I know, he never spent a night, never slept there. Uh, he, he always went to Bethany right on the other side of the all of it, just a Sabbath day journey, just a very short ways. And he spent a lot of time in that particular place. And he spent a lot of time in the house of these people he's talking about here. He's talking about Lazarus. He's the man that was sick. And then we find that his sister Mary and his uh, her sister Martha, they lived in this particular place. Matter of fact, this is the Mary that anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with the hair whose brother Lazarus was sick. Verse number two clarifies that, which Mary this was. Now, you've got two Marys that did that. One, you've got Mary Magdalene. She's the one that at seven devils went out of that woman. That, that woman lived a hard life before she ever came to Christ. Uh, matter of fact, when she was in the house of Simon uh, the Pharisee, uh, hey, she, just, she anointed his feet with her tears and, and wiped his feet with the hair on her head. And old Simon thought within himself if he knew what manner of woman this was. Oh, and the Lord, he, he knew what he thought. And the Lord just said, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he dealt with whom much is forgiven they love very much all right this is a different Mary this Mary you've got Martha you've got Mary but the Lord spent a lot of time Mary was the one that is found at the feet of Jesus Christ when Martha her sister was cumbered with a, a lot of chores and a lot of work in the kitchen so we, we've got a family here that the Lord spent a lot of time with let me just Today. I'm not going to stay with my notes a whole lot right here, but I want you to understand the relationship that they had. Jesus Christ spent many days in their home. I, I got to thinking about that. Could you imagine Almighty God staying in your house? They knew who He was. 
They knew who he was the Messiah. They knew that he was the son of God. They knew that he was God incarnate. And yet he stayed in their house at a lot of times. I just thought about him sitting around the table blessing the food and breaking the bread for them. How would you like the Lord praying over your meals? Huh? He comes in and he spends time with you. I, I thought about maybe uh, at their family devotions. That the Lord was there when they opened the Word of God together as man and wife, and the Lord was in there to mentor them, to teach them the, the Word of God. I thought about just sitting around in the evenings with Him and sitting around just small talking with Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to understand small talking with Christ is not necessarily talking about the weather. I believe he talked about the things of God to them and they listened to the Son of God in their house. So they're very familiar with Jesus Christ and he's very familiar with them. Notice in verse number three, Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold him whom thou lovest. Oh, how he loved Lazarus and Martha and Mary. Loved them. Said, Lord, he whom thou lovest is sick. Lazarus is sick. And they sent for Lazarus. They just simply wanted him to come. Verse number four. When Jesus heard that, he said this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. We'll come back to that verse. It's an important verse. Verse number five. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late salt to stone thee, and thou goest thither again. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Verse 11, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. The Bible uses that terminology a lot of times when it's talking about death in the Bible. He's talking about just simply that the body sleeps until that time that God will resurrect that body. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we find here, he said, Our friend Lazarus sleepest, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Then said his disciple, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. They misunderstood what he said. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. We find in here that the Lord intentionally delayed going to see Lazarus and going to that household. I want to deal tonight with just a short subject when God seemingly comes too late. When God seemingly, I use that word seemingly because you understand with me that God is never late for anything. God's not early, God's not late, God comes on time. Christ came on time, but for them, they sent to him. Matter of fact, they asked a couple of times, and I thought this was real interesting. In verses 21, and then again in 32, Martha first made this statement. He said, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. So actually she indicted the Lord when it came. She said, if you'd have been here, Lord, Lazarus would have never died. You know, nobody ever died in the presence of Jesus Christ. That's why on the cross he so graciously dismissed his spirit so that those two thieves didn't have to hang there as long as, hey, he just simply shortened things for their mercy on their sake. But we find in verse 32 that Mary made the, exactly the same statement. She said, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. Now, that leads me to believe that in the time that they called on him to come and Lazarus died and then Jesus showed up. In that time frame, 
They had evidently been talking at home. They probably wondered why Christ never showed up. They knew he wasn't that far away. When they sent for him, they knew he was not far away. And them saying the same thing in two different places at two different times, saying the same word, that tells me that I, I'm sure they probably sat down after Lazarus died and said, you know, if the Lord had been here, our brother had not died. So the discussion probably took place in the house concerning that. You know, sometimes I, I, I think about uh, we, we call on the name of the Lord because we've got some terrible thing going on in our life, an accident or sickness, health issues, uh, family issues, or whatever. And, and we call, and Jesus uh, simply does not at that time answer that request for you. He doesn't, you know, God can do anything, anytime, anywhere. God's not limited. He's not limited by time or circumstances. The one who created the heavens and the earth and all that in them is has the power. I was reading over in the Psalms this morning where the Bible said twice hath God spoken that power belongeth unto God. God owns power. God has healing power. God has all types of power. He can do anything. They had watched Christ over the three years that he was walking on the face of the earth, they had watched him heal multitudes of people. I'm talking about people that were blind, dumb, uh, people that couldn't walk, lepers. They, they had watched him do all these miracles, and they thought if we can just get him here, Lazarus is going to be all right. But Lazarus died before he got there. He waited before he came. And I thought about that sudden... Uh, fear uh, of losing that brother and him dying. What I want to look at tonight is two reasons why Jesus waited. Very quickly, and then I'm going to deal with something else. In verse number four, I want you to notice what he said. When Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. The word glory means it's simply in that verse an attribute of God itself. He said, but for the glory of God. Uh, you don't have to glorify God. God's already glorified. So we find for the glory of God Himself. I've thought about God the Father. You know, the Bible talks about true worshipers. Uh, they come to God for who He is. Over in John chapter 4, the Bible says, but the hour cometh. And now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. We find in the Lord's Prayer, one of the other chapters in here where you see the humanity of God coupled with the deity of God is in chapter number 17. Chapter 17 of the book of John is the Lord's Prayer. You get to go to the Garden of Gethsemane with Him. This morning I was reading a portion over uh, Mark chapter number 15 uh, where the disciples continued to sleep. He took them and He told them to stay and uh, observe and to wait. And he, every time He came back, they were asleep again. We find Him in that Garden of Gethsemane. We find both His humanity and we find His deity in that place. So we find here that the glory of God. One, they said that sickness was not uh, a sickness unto death, but something that was going to show the glory of God in their life. The model prayer speaks of the glory of God. Over in Matthew 6, many people call this the uh, Lord's Prayer. It's actually the model prayer. The, the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he gave them a pattern by which we ought to pray. And by the way, it's good if you pray according to that pattern. But it begins, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's talking about the hallowed name of God. The hallowed name. That word hallowed means to make, preserve, announce, and to sanctify as holy. The first mention of how it was found actually in Exodus chapter 20 and verse number 11. 
The Bible said, For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He hallowed that day. So one, we find that the glory of God was shown in the miracle that He's going to do in just a little while. The second thing was that the Son of God might be glorified. In verse 4 again, He said that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. I thought about the Son being glorified. You know, if, if you go to a doctor and the doctor gets you well, it, it glorifies the doctor. If you take a medicine and the medicine work, it, it glorifies the medicine and the ones that made the medicine. If you have an old home treatment, thank God for home treatments. Somebody said one time, if you got a bad cold, it takes you about two weeks to get over it. If you go to a doctor, it only takes 14 days. So we find that if you glorify these old treatments, I remember the poluses they put under your neck. My mother used to take uh, Vicks Vapor Rub. Boy, if you remember, she'd put it on our back, she'd put it on our chest, she'd put it up under our nose, she would stick it up our nose, and I'll tell you what, it, it, it covered a multitude of sins. She used to put it in hot water on the stove and then let it start steaming and put a towel over our head and let us breathe that. We had a lot of old home remedies. See, we didn't go to the doctor when we were kids. I don't remember ever going to the doctor but once. That's when my appendix ruptured in 1952. 1952, I had an appendectomy done uh, in the early spring of that year. But we find these things glorify man. But he said that what he was going to do in the death of Lazarus was going to glorify the Son of God himself. When there are no earthly answers, then God gets all the glory. And Jesus Christ gets glorified. So we find one, the glorification of God. Now, what I want to deal with in verse number 15, if you'll notice with me, he said, And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that you might believe. Nevertheless, let us go into it. Now, we find a second reason that he delayed in verse number 15. He said that your faith, that you might believe, you may believe that their faith would be strengthened. Their faith. Boy, how important is faith tonight? Hey, I thank God. The Bible talks about faith. Faith is something that's unseen. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's Hebrews chapter number 12 uh, or verse uh, chapter number 11. But we find this thing called faith. What trials sometime are for are to increase your faith. I have faith in God with these things. So we find that their faith. Faith had never seen the resurrection power that's going to take place in verse number 11. They had not seen this. Now the Lord raised several people. But we find in chapter number 11 that He's going to tell Lazarus who's been dead. He stinketh. He's been in the grave four days that he's going to say come forth and he's going to resurrect in front of them. So what he's doing, he's strengthening their faith. So I thought about trials in your life. You know, sometimes you have hard places in life you don't understand. By the way, I want to say again that life is one, it's hard. Two, it's unfair. A lot of times it's unjust. We find these things in life. I, listen, if you just got to learn to take it on the chin. That's why he said in Ephesians chapter 6 that you might be able to withstand in the evil day. Take a punch and having done all to stand. Because there may come a time in your life when you do like the psalmist did and you ask God a question, Lord, how long? You find that several times when trials go on and on and on. And it seems like that they're never going to be alleviated. We, we all have these trials. Barbara and I have these trials. You've got these trials. Some things, they are the gift that just keeps on giving. I mean, they just, they will not go away. They don't get any better. It doesn't matter how much you pray about them over the years. They just continue to be there. And, they, and you live with these things. And there's going to come a time in your life when you're going to just look at God and say, how long? Hey, 
I'm not afraid to ask him that. But we need to understand something. God's time is not our time. And they, they wanted him to come immediately and heal Lazarus. But God didn't want to come immediately and heal Lazarus. He wanted Lazarus to die. He wanted them to have a funeral. He wanted them to put him in a tomb. And they will leave him in there long enough that when he said, roll that stone away, they said, he's been, he's, Lord, he's stinking after four days. They didn't embalm like the Egyptians did. They just simply took those bodies and wrapped them in linen and spices and put them in that grave. So we find that God's time was not their time and it caused them to look at Him and say, Lord, if Thou hast been here, our brother had not died. Well, if He had been there, then I don't believe God would have gotten the glory that He wanted to teach in these verses. These verses, are, they come alive to you in our, uh, in our lives as we go through things and we go through valleys. I, I, uh, I go through the valley of the shadow of death. I sometimes wonder how long that valley is going to be for me. It will be a time to when you're going to die. Some people just die and they die quickly. I think that's a blessing when they do that. Some people... They struggle over a long period of time. Sometimes for years they struggle. Their health goes, their mind goes, and they've got to be taken care of just like small children. And sometimes, hey, I've just asked God before, hey, when I had good assurance somebody was saved, I have no problem just telling the Lord, if they're saved, Lord, and they say they are, why don't just take them on home? Just shorten that valley. I don't want to die over a long period of time. That's one thing about the actually the good physical condition I'm in, not leg-wise and all this, but heart and lungs. I'm scared to death they won't be able to shut my heart down <laughs> these days. I'm just going to have to lay there and that thing just keep on a beating and a beating and a beating. You know, they asked a guy one time, he's living a bad lifestyle, and they told him, they said, you're going to shorten your life. He said, oh, I'm going to lose those slobbering years. We don't, we don't know how long sometime our trials may be. You know, I've known people that suffered for years and years and then finally died and never got an answer to their prayer, but God answered later. So we find that God's time in here was not their time. And sometimes you just ask the Lord, why? This is Lazarus, whom thou lovest, Lord. Why do people have to get sick? Have you ever heard so much cancer? It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It affects your family. It affects my family. Right now, it's affecting our oldest granddaughter. I mean, I'm trying to, I've, I've asked God, Lord, give me the stuff and let a 25-year-old girl live. Let her live. But God, God doesn't all the way, He doesn't do that. I don't ask Him why. We sat on the deck and talked about this afternoon. Hey, I told her, you don't mess with God's toys. These are things that God allows. It's not necessarily something that God does, but it's something that God has to allow. And sometimes we just stop and say, why? That old saying, why me, Lord? And then they said, the Lord said, why not you? Why my family? Why your family? Why do you have to suffer the way you do in this life? Sometimes it's simply for God's glory, but other times it's also that your faith might be strengthened in those areas. So we find the question, how long and why? Then sometimes you might even ask the Lord, do you really care? Does Jesus care? Oh, that song. You, you, hey, we sing that sometimes. Does Jesus care? Oh, yes, He cares. You know, sometimes people think that maybe, maybe God doesn't care. He doesn't care if people suffer the way they do. You know, the Bible said that he is touched with the feeling of our infirmity. God knows what you feel. God knows exactly what you feel. He was tempted in all points like as we are and without sin. But we find that the Son of God knows what it's like to lose a loved one. I'm talking about in his humanity. He knew what it was like to lose a father before his public ministry. You don't find Joseph mentioned anywhere past when Christ was 12 years of age at the temple. You don't find Joseph anywhere mentioned. I believe that God removed him because his father 
was Almighty God, not an earthly father, and God actually just took him on home to be with the Lord. I believe Joseph was a good godly man, but he had lived his purpose in his life. He had lived that thing out. So I thought about sometimes, does God care? You never will know how much God cares. What God cares. We'll find in here the shortest verse in the Bible. Verse number 35, the Bible says Jesus wept. Jesus wept with them at the grave of Lazarus. I'm talking about strengthening your faith. You'll find out that God always cares. God knows where you're at. He knows where you're going. God will take care of you all the way along. And then sometime you just ask, Lord, do you really love me? Boy, I, I, I hate somebody... Uh, ask me, preacher, do you li really love me? Hey, if I didn't love you, you'd know it. I'm not like the man I told his wife he loved her when he got married and never told her again. He said, if anything changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> All right. That's not the way you keep a good marriage uh, going on at the same time. But I'm talking about faith tonight. We don't like tribulation. But in verse number 22, I want to show you this real quick. We find that the faith was there. Verse number 32, And when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But if you look on down a little bit farther as he talked to them, they, they exercised their faith. They, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Boy, what a blessed thing that he showed them who he was and, and what he could do. But we find their faith. But they said, whatsoever you do now, you can do it. God's able to do that. I don't like tribulation tonight. You don't like tribulation, but tribulation worketh patience. Somebody told me years ago, you don't need to be praying for, uh, for patience because you'll get tribulation. I told them, the Bible said for uh, God knows that you have need of patience. So if you have need of patience, I'd rather be asking for it than have to get it the hard way. But tribulation and problems make us a patient people. One patient with others. Boy, what, what a blessing when you can look on others and you're touched with the feeling of their infirmity. You know, a lot of times if you go into a valley, these other people, there'll be somebody else that's going to follow you in. Somewhere down. We've had cancer in our immediate family, and Barbara has been able to talk to and help a lot of ladies that were going through the same thing. I mean, just they just kind of migrate to you. And so we find that you can be a help to somebody else because patience then worketh experience. Years ago when I was trying to get on to mines, I kept going out to see the superintendent of the mines, and he kept telling me, we're only hiring experienced men. And I remember one trip out to the mines. I went in and see him. He said, we're just hiring experienced men. And I just told him, I said, if you'll tell me where I can go buy some experience, I'll get you a bucket full of it and bring it back. I can't get experience if you're not going to let me go in the mine and go to work. And then experience hope. Our faith is a hope tonight. I don't hope God is God. I don't hope He's coming. I know He's coming. He's our blessed hope tonight. But we find here that He did something that strengthened their faith because one day Lazarus would die again. You know, He's one of the few men that died twice. The Bible says He appointed unto man once to die, but God overruled that in certain areas. Enoch never did die. Elijah didn't die, but he will die in the book of Revelation. He's one of the two witnesses. Then we find Lazarus here, he had to die twice. But we find that he increased their faith in these verses. I just wanted to say tonight, listen, God always is on time. I don't mess with God's time. I don't mess with God's way, and I don't mess with his thoughts. Uh, Barbara and I had a long talk out there in the swing today, and I told her, we're just going to trust God. We're going to trust Him all the way with this. God knows where we are. God knows what's going on. God will take care of it, and He'll do it His time, His way, and His will. But where are you tonight? Some of you probably got something that you wonder why God won't fix it. 
We live in the days of instant. Everything's an instant fix. Isn't that a blessing, man? Talking about somebody that having a little bit of problem, and I told him I can fix it with super glue or JB Weld. <laughs> I can take that JB Weld, and within 24 hours, you can do whatever you want to. It's as hard as the steel that's around it. Super glue, boy, has hasn't that been a blessing to people? First time I ever used it, I glued three of my fingers to a piece of metal. And the only way to get them off is I peeled the meat off of those three of them. I was welding, uh, put, uh, it might as well weld it, putting a, a microphone holder back in the days when everybody had CBs. My handle was Dishonest John back in those days, DJ. And I remember gluing that thing on there and I was laying it halfway under and holding that thing and when I got done I said, uh oh. Everybody wants a quick fix. You may not get a quick fix. But I want to promise you one thing. You wait on God, you'll get the right fix. You'll get it the right way. you get it the right time. And God maketh no mistake. God has never made a mistake. God never will. I tell God, you do not do wrong. You cannot do wrong. And if God does something or God allows something, then we've got to trust God with it. And we find here it did two things. One, it glorified God the Father and the Son. And then we find that it increased their faith. We need people of faith tonight. People to mentor the ones that come behind us. A little story I'm going to tell you and then we're going to go home. But an old man one time crossed a raging river. When he got to the other side, he sat down and... He looked back and there was another man coming across and he crossed that river so skillfully. And he watched him as he crossed that river. When he got to the same side the old man was on, he started building a bridge back over it. The old man watched him a few minutes and he asked him, he said, I saw you so skillfully come across that river and now you're building a bridge back. Why? He said, there's a young man that follows after me who's not as skilled as I and he may perish in the crossing. Sometime God allows something in your life, in my life, that somewhere down the road that we can give help to somebody else in walking in our shoes and our steps one of these days. One, your trials are to glorify God, and two, they are to build your faith. We stand tonight. You need to come tonight, you come. God does all things well. He does them right, He does them on time. You need to come tonight, you come.